Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the UEA Lasden Lecture. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, my name is Professor Brian Reid. Um, I'm Associate Pro Vice Chancellor for Research at UEA, um, and it's such a delight to be back in London in such a wonderful surrounding at the Royal Institute. Um, it's also delightful to see so many alumni, friends of the university here this evening, and a welcome to those who are joining us on YouTube um, online. Um, please let us know where you're joining from. That'd be fascinating to know. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I'd just like to make a small request of everybody. Um, we'll be sending out a brief survey via email um, in the coming days to canvas your views on tonight's event, and it would be helpful in planning future lectures if you could take the time to tell us what you think. Um, and a little plug, we've got one more Lasden lecture in June um, regarding narrating the climate crisis. So uh, you, you booked for here, so the same place to book for that as well. So on to tonight. Uh, this evening, we're going to hear from UEA's Dr. Alpar Lazar and Dr. Joe Bohr about the significance of sleep for health and well-being. At the end of the presentations, there will, of course, be an open floor for questions, and I'm sure there'll be many. And for those joining via YouTube, if you can put your questions in the chat, we'll field those as well. So to our first speaker this evening, Dr. Apar Lazar is Associate Professor and Principal Investigator in the School of Health Sciences at UEA. He has a strong research interest in the significance of human sleep in brain health, with particular focus on ageing. In the last 10 years, Alpar has engaged in study, studying the role of sleep in ageing and neurodegeneration. Following his PhD studies in Budapest, Alpar moved to the UK in 2008 to continue to contribute to a high-profile sleep and circadian rhythm experiment at the Surrey Sleep Research Centre. Three years later, he moved to the University of Cambridge, where he investigated the significance of early sleep deficits in Huntington's disease. Alpar joined the University of East Anglia in 2016, and he has spearheaded the launch of the Sleep and Brain Research Unit and has been leading multiple sleep research studies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alpar Lazar to the lecture. Good evening. Thank you very much, Ryan, for this very nice introduction. And thank you, uh, UEA, for um, organizing this um, event. And I feel honored, uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, particularly in this amazing setting. Today, I would like just to share a little bit with you my interest in sleep research, some of those topics that you know keep me uh, working uh, quite actively in this area. <clears throat> So probably we all know that uh, experience. We all we all have gone through those days when we feel refreshed in the morning, and we know that when we really are we really are up to something very important. We want the best version of ourselves. Then we need a good night rest before that, and we also know how it is when that's not the case, and we have to use the alarm clock to wake up us, because our physiology still would require some more rest. But we can't afford that, because we have social commitments. And that's going to mark our day. It's going to impact on our performance across various activities. Therefore, you may find in various cultures across the globe that people keep sleeping, practicing the art of sleeping in, in, in public. And that's because a nap helps to you know, boost energy, boost performance. It, in Japan, there is even a concept for that, the term called inamuri, where people, in a way, take pride in taking a nap uh, in public spaces that's going to boost their performance. It's not something strange to see. I wanted to share you a research which was a common effort uh, undertaken by uh, Sainsbury's and also Oxford Economics. They wanted to understand how important is sleep for people in, living in the UK. So how would people report the importance of sleep? So they, they created a survey, quite a few questions, and uh, <clears throat> they took a representative sample from the population, and they developed a so-called living well index. 
And in one of those, ana those analyses they run, they compared people who reported top quality of life, top living well uh, scores, to those who had average or poor. And when they ranked the features which best differentiated those people, this is what they found. Interestingly, sleep quality topped the ranking, best differentiating in a way people uh, who reported top quality of life compared to those who reported typical or poor. And this wasn't done by sleep scientists. It, it didn't come from a sleep grant because it came from you know, from an organization who certainly won't make money out of that because Sainsbury is not going to sell sleep anymore any, uh, anytime soon. And it's therefore, it's quite credible. And I'd like to, to start showing that people, if they are asked really about, about the importance of sleep, they find sleep, uh, sleep quite important in their everyday life. Now, everybody talks about the importance of sleep in cognition, because we know that if we don't sleep sufficient, that could impact on our cognitive performance. This is one of the first study where they clearly showed that sleep is not only associated with cognitive performance, like a correlation or relationship without causality, but there's a clear dose-dependent association, just like with a medication. So what they did, they took a group of people, young healthy participants, who were, after a few baseline days and nights, they were randomized into different sleep lengths opportunity subgroups. And they had to spend that amount of sleep per day, like eight hours, six hours, four hours, and no sleep at all for a couple of days, for several days. Like, like for 14 days, those who had some, uh, some uh, longer sleep opportunity. And then they performed various cognitive assessments. So here you can see uh, a simple test, which we call the digit simple substitution test, where people have to attend to certain stimuli. They have to link up numbers uh, with symbols. It's, it's quite sensitive to attentional functions and short-term or so-called working memory. And here you can see the results. At the beginning, they were all very similar in their performance, but those people who had the normal sleep opportunity, they gradually improved in their performance. And that's what we expect. If you practice something, we get better at that. However, those who had a partial sleep deprivation, they didn't improve much. And those who were sleep deprived in a dose-dependent relationship impaired in their performance clearly establishing a dose-dependent mechanistic association between sleep duration and cognition. Now, this is quite an important result if you consider those high-profile longitudinal studies, like this one, where they clearly establish an association between short sleep duration and dementia risk. So this was published a couple of years ago, showing that those people who sleep less than six hours have an increased risk uh, of developing dementia. And of course, people like to say, well, that may be just an association. But in, in, the, in light of the previous study, that's, that's not the case, probably. A recent study tried to investigate how sleep deprivation impacts on the age of the brain. So they, they developed a new metric based, of, based on artificial intelligence, analyzing huge amount of data of brain imaging, and they developed a new metric of brain age. And they looked through studies which investigated sleep deprivation and, of course, bra brain imaging. And what they found that after a total sleep deprivation night, there was a one to two year increase in, in, the, in the age of the brain. But the good news was that it was reversible. So after the recovery night, it got back to the normal state. Unfortunately, there is no sufficient study at the moment to, to see how multiple days of partial chronic sleep deprivation impact brain aging. But sleep is not important only, it's not only for brain is important, but it's important for the entire organism. And here you can see the association in a very large sample size study between sleep and BM, or body mass index. And we can see that shorter sleep is associated with increased body mass, basically leading to obesity. 
Well, it's a very interesting finding in the light that if we look in other species, mammals, particularly herbivores, we can see a similar negative correlation between sleep duration and, and, uh, and, and body weight. What's the key and what's the explanation of this association? We are not really sure, but it's clearly sleep has a role in energy conservation in, 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 in the feeding regime. And there is evidence showing that sleep deprivation, for example, leads to type 2 uh, diabetes. Now, how long do we, do we need to sleep and how much we sleep? In, in a recent study led by UCL, questioning over 700,000 people, we found that the average sleep, was, sleep duration was about seven hours, with a difference, an average difference between men and women of eight minutes only, women sleeping slightly longer than men. Now, interestingly, there was a U-shaped relationship between age and sleep duration. As you can see, in young ad adulthood, there is a decline in sleep duration with no much change in middle adulthood and an increase in sleep length in later adulthood. We shouldn't forget this is self-reported, not objectively measured sleep duration, but very high sample size. If we compare these results to a previous study where they looked at a, a similarly larger sample size study, so there are thousands of people in the study as well, but separately for work days and free days. They found that this decline in sleep duration in adulthood is present only during free days. There is no much change during work days, indicating in a way that our physiological decline in sleep need is reflected only in our sleep during free days, whereas during work days, as soon as we start our work life, it's, there's no much change there. What's the implication? Well, obviously, sorry. Obviously, there is, this is going to lead to social jet lag and social sleep restriction, particularly in the younger adults who become chronically sleep deprived during work days because their in intrinsic sleep need is much higher than, than they can sleep because of their work life. Now, why this is worrying? Because in another longitudinal study, eight years longitudinal study, they found that sleep duration during work days gradually declines with no much change uh, in, in free day sleep duration. And also in this study we found, in the previous large sample size study, there's some kind of geographical effect on sleep, uh, sleep duration. This, this geographical e effect is not only related to latitude, because there's, as you can see, there's a clear positive association between latitude and, and sleep duration. The further away we live from the equator, the more sleep we have. But, but there are some economic culture factors as well, because it, you, you may see um, on, on the graph that, that Eastern Europeans tend to sleep the longest, whereas the Southeast Asian people sleep the shortest. Here I would highlight, for example, Singapore, which is a well-developed country, and also on the equator. They, they are really among the shortest ones. Now, the, the problem is that we live in a 24-7, 52 society where we have to work a lot, and if we want to socialize, of course, the first thing we are going to sacrifice is sleep. And this, this creates a problem in our industrialized society, which has been already declared by the Centers of Disease Control in the U USA a public health problem, where more than one third of adults report not getting enough sleep, and the, and the frequency of insomnia is also quite high. Why is this is relevant for our health? Because there are numerous studies establishing strong relationship between impaired sleep and negative adverse health outcomes. We are particularly interested in those associations which point to a bidirectional link between sleep impairment and age-dependent cognitive decline and dementia. Now, but what is sleep? Well, of course, sleep is a evolutionarily well-concerned behavior. The fact that most species, even the Cassiopeia, the upside-down uh, uh, swimming uh, jellyfish sleeps, it's, it shows that it's quite important for our life. Of course, the spe species specific, what's the timing of sleep, what's the position, the duration of sleep, and the, but, but it's a fact that it's indispensable. Now, 
when we talk about sleep, people like to, de to binarize it as sleep or not sleep, but we have three vigilance states, not two, which is wake, no REM sleep, and REM sleep. And interestingly, REM sleep, the rapid eye movement sleep, is al looks almost like wake. It's also called paradoxical sleep because in terms of autonomic arousal, our heart rate, respiration, blood pressure, and even the brain activity is very similar to wakefulness. And we are still unconscious and, and not responsive. And therefore, it probably has a, diff a very dedicated function for our brain health, which is a little bit still a mystery. We know much more about non-REM sleep, which by its key slow oscillation and hallmark brain activities secures the restoration process of our sleep, of our brain during sleep. Now, of course, the relative distribution of the different vigilance stages changes with life. Where babies have lots of sleep and lots of REM sleep, where we grow older, we hardly have slow wave sleep and hardly, hardly have any REM sleep left. Now, it, sleep also is quite a stereotypic function. As soon as we switch off the light trying to go to sleep, our brain transits into a slower and slower activate, activity level. It's a deacceleration of the brain activity. But this is periodical because after about 90 minutes, it transits to an abrupt arousal, which we call REM sleep. And this, depending on the total length of sleep duration, repeats intermittently throughout the night. And that's so-called the sleep cycle. Now, here you can see uh, real sleep data. We call it the hypnogram, as it's as derived from a polysomnography study and, uh, of, a, of a healthy person. And what you can see, there is quite a bit of deep sleep in the first part of the night and much more superficial sleep in the second part of the night and some REM sleep in between, with more REM sleep always in the second part of the night. But there are other physiological changes as well. There is an increase in the melatonin, which peaks about the middle of the night. There is a gradual decline in, in the core body temperature and a gradual increase in cortisol. And the phase relationship between these uh, other hormonal changes are pretty important for our, the quality of our sleep. And we shouldn't forget about the growth hormone, which preferentially is released during slow wave sleep. And it's not only important for growth, well, obviously for the development of children, but it's also important for our neuroprotection and all the healing processes of various tissues. Now, if we want to objectively characterize sleep, normally we derive similar measures, such as you can see there, the sleep efficiency, total sleep duration. We can characterize clearly the sleep profile of a person. Here you can see a younger and an older uh, hypnogram in terms of people, adults who were uh, studied. And if you, if you carefully look at it, you can see that in the older person, the sleep duration is shorter, it's, and it's much more fragmented with less slow wave sleep, less, less deep sleep. So that's what happens. It's, it's not necessarily the sleep duration. That also decreases, but the quality of sleep becomes more disrupted. Now, how this entire sleep-wake balance is, is regulated? We are diurnal species. We like to be awake during the day. Our brain activity is, is accelerated. There's lots of neural firing. Basically, it burns fuel. Now, when we burn fuel, we create pollution, just like cars do. There's lots of pollution produced in the brain, and of course, all the batteries are uh, depleted gradually. When we, and this, this is associated with a gradual increase in daytime exhaustion, fatigue, sleepiness. As we fall asleep, our brain activity, as driven by active brain processes, slows down and gives a respite to those neurons, and that's what we call slow-wave sleep those neurons start firing in a totally different mode, which allows all the depleted energy storages to be replenished, and also for all the waste products of the burning process to be cleared out. And this happens in a one third, two third ratio between sleep and wakefulness. We call it uh, Sleep-wake homeostasis, which is like an hourglass system where the more we sleep, the more, more we are awake, the more sleep we need. Now, in this entire process, sleep-wake balance, the slow-wave sleep, this very deaccelerated, slow brain activity has a key function. 
Here you can see the power, after quantitatively and analyzing the EEG activity, the brain oscillatory activity, you can see that there's the energy of the slow wave sleep is quite high in the first sleep cycle in a normal sleep period. And after a 40 hour sleep deprivation, leads to a rebound. So there's quite a bit of slow wave sleep, but always only in the first couple of hours. Clearly showing that there's a high homeostatic drive. So that's, that enjoys priority. As soon as we fall asleep, we need to produce low wave sleep, not REM sleep, light sleep, anything else. Interestingly, if we, after a normal, normal night of sleep, if we take a nap in the early evening hours, we also produce lots of slow wave sleep, as you can see there. And then, during the subsequent night, we, have, we can't produce enough slow wave sleep. That's going to make our sleep disrupted. And this is one of the mechanisms what perpetuates insomnia. When people feel tired during the day, they, they take a nap. Of course, they feel refreshed after that because it helps, but then they find very hard to, to sleep again in a way showing that there's a certain amount of sleep, slow wave sleep we can produce. Now, what's also interesting in this context that it's not only sleep that affects wakefulness, but wakefulness affects sleep. In, a, in an older experiment, they simply stimulated the hands of a participant. It was a randomized trial, right hand, left hand, and they were looking at the brain activity, EG activity, after, during the subsequent night in the somatosensorial projection areas. And what they found, it was in line with the hypothesis. Those brain regions which were stimulated before going to bed, they presented the most increase in slow wave sleep. And they, this, this type of experiments were repeated, in, were repeated in, in animals as well. They trimmed the whiskers on one side, clearly showing that sleep is not necessarily a global phenomenon, but it's a local. Certain parts of the brain which work more during the day, are more engaged in firing and activity during the day, they will need more sleep. And what's the explanation? How this works in a, in, in, in the, in the physio, at the physiological level? There is an influential theory which is called the synaptic homeostasis theory of sleep, slow wave sleep, which has quite a bit of evidence base. According to this theory, when we are awake, our neurons fire at a very high rate, and therefore they established, they develop communication, LTPs, long-term potentiation, or synapses. It's, there's a general upscaling of, of synaptic strengths. And when we fall asleep, the entire activity changes, it slows down, there's no communication. And therefore, some of the connections between the neurons, due to this very, very scarce communication, is going to, it's not going to survive the night, they disappear, they get pruned, and all the others get weakened as well. So there is an overall downscaling of synaptic strengths, so recalibration, let's say so. But there's a benefit to that, because it's going to maximize the signal noise ratio. All the noise disappears from the brain, and we will remember what we really wanted to remember, all the target information what we encoded. It's one of, the, one of the processes leading to me memory consolidation. But besides the sleep-wake homeostasis, we have also a body clock in our organism. And that body, body clock is driven by a molecular system, a clear transcription and trans translational feedback loop, which was awarded, the discovery of this, uh, of this entire mechanism was awarded by Nobel Prize in 2017. And this timekeeper, is different, it's totally independent from sleep-wake homeostasis. And here you can see studies which were running carefully, for example, in the Surrey Sleep Research Center where, where they uniquely run um, this forced synchrony protocols where they put people in forced jet-lag protocols allowing to separate the sleep-wake homeostasis from the circadian rhythm. And what you can see here that sleep efficiency or the propensity of sleep has a clear time of the day effect. During the night where you can see in the background the gray melatonin increase, that's the time where our sleep efficiency is the highest. 
and during the day is, is low. But it's not only sleep, it's cognition. If you look on the right panel, you can see cognitive performance, or pointing, higher performance pointing to up. That during the night, whatever we do, even if we are not sleep deprived, we will perform worse. So if you sleep during the day and you try to be awake uh, uh, during the night, you won't perform as good just because there is a body clock effect on our cognition. And that's what leads to the current understanding of sleep-wake regulation, which we call the two-process model of sleep-wake regulation, where as soon as we wake up, there is a gradual increase in sleep propensity. But if that was the only timekeeper, we would fall asleep in the second part of the night, of, of the day. But simultaneously, there is a circadian arousal signal will, which opposes this decline in arousal that projects an increasing arousal to the brain peaking just before bedtime, about two hours before bedtime, which we call the wake maintenance zone. And this is the time of the day when we are least likely to be able to fall asleep. It probably has evolutional benefits. But as soon as we cross this peak of our circadian arousal signal, driven by the huge homeostatic load accumulated during the day, we can have a good night's sleep associated with the drop of the core body temperature. Now, because it's sleep dissipation follows an exponential function, it dissipates very quickly. In the second part of the night, we hardly have any sleep pressure left and we can wake up. But then the trough of the circadian arousal signals keeps us asleep, and that's called the sleep maintenance zone. So you can see there's a clear need for the two timekeepers to keep synchronized. And this is my last slide, which tries to explain in, in, a, in a 3D how the two timekeepers work together in younger and older people. What you can see on the x-axis is the time of the day or circadian phase. And what you can see on the, uh, the z-axis is the time spent in sleep. On the y-axis, you can see the propensity to, to wakefulness, which is the opposite of sleep. And what we can see that at the beginning of any time of the day, we can fall asleep very easily. The wake propensity is very low. But as soon as we fall asleep, we tend to wake up. The propensity of sleep increases. There is only one narrow time window during the circadian day, the entire 24-hour day, when we fall asleep easily and we can stay asleep easily. And that's the circadian night. And as we grow older, you can also see that that time, the optimal time window is becoming shorter, much narrower. So we, required, we are required to be even more cautious about the time of the day we try to, fall, we try to go to sleep. And with this, I would like just to highlight that our research interest at UEA partly focuses on under, in, uh, to understanding the role of the sleep-wake homeostasis and circadian rhythmicity on brain health, and with a particular focus on aging and dementia. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, our second speaker tonight is Joe Bauer. Uh, Dr. Joe Bauer is a lecturer in the UEA School of Psychology uh, with research interests in how sleep and emotional uh, responding interact to influence mental health and well-being. After several years working with sleep-related clinical trials, Joe completed her PhD at the University of Reading, focusing on the regulation of positive emotions. Following this, she was able to combine her interests in sleep and emotion through contributing to a NASA-funded project investigating risk and resilience factors for individuals in isolation, confinement and extreme environments. Jo arrived at UEA in 2020 and is passionate about improving public knowledge relating to sleep. She is co-founder of the Sleep and Insomnia Network East Anglia and a member of the Sleep Research Society. Over to you, Jo. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for being here um, and allowing me to share some of my research, which I'm really excited about, which really looks at the interactions between sleep and mental health. But before we start, I'd like you to imagine a scenario. 
So imagine you've had a really bad night's sleep. You've come down in the morning, someone is being really annoying, your partner, your friend, your colleague, whoever it might be, they just won't stop talking, they're really, really annoying. What happens next? Now I'd imagine for some of you what happens next is you snap. You're like, will you please just give me five minutes peace? And perhaps you feel a bit guilty afterwards, but you just say, oh, do you know what? I was just so tired. But then perhaps for others of you, what happens is you think, oh, do you know what? I would normally find that really, really annoying, but I was just too tired to care. <laughs> and what I find really fascinating is that we've got the same two stressors. We've got being sleep deprived, and we've got someone being really annoying. But we've got two completely opposite reactions. And so what I'm really interested in is, well, why do different people have different reactions? And how do these different reactions have an influence on our well-being? And that's really the basis of what I'm going to talk about tonight. So I'm going to start then by explaining a little bit more about these relationship between sleep and mental health. And as we've already established, if we don't sleep very well, it can change how we deal with things the next day. And over time, we know that people who have prolonged periods of not sleeping very well are also at increased risk of other mental health problems like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, OCD, the list goes on. But what we also know is that people who experience those conditions are at much, much higher risk of also having sleep problems. So up to 90% of people who experience depression also experience sleep problems. And there's similar relationships when you think about sleep and anxiety as well. And I think that makes sense. Because if you think about being really worried about something, then quite often when you go to bed, that's when your brain kicks in, doesn't it? And it turns on and it goes, well, maybe I'll worry about this, and maybe this awful thing could happen, and perhaps that disaster could happen. And before you know it, it's the middle of the night, and you're looking at your watch, and you're thinking, I've only got four hours to sleep. I'm going to feel awful tomorrow. Three hours, two hours. This is going to be a disaster. And the two interplay. And so that's really quite well established. We know that there's this really integral relationship between sleep and mental health. But what's interesting to me is why. And I think one of the important candidates for this is emotion regulation. And emotion regulation literally just means what we do to manage our emotions. So if you have some really good news and you phone a friend and you savour it and you celebrate, that's a form of emotion regulation. If you have a really bad day and you go home and you kick your shoes off, you put your favourite box set on the TV and you shut out the world and you think, oh, that feels better. That's a form of emotion regulation. And what I really like about this as a candidate is that emotion regulation doesn't just have to happen after the emotion has formed. So in the examples I've just given you, it does. You have an emotion, and then you either try and prolong it if it's good, or you try and minimize it if it's bad. But you can also manipulate your emotional experience before you've even had an emotion. And that's in a process that I'm going to talk to you about that's called situation selection. And at its most basic level, situation selection is choosing to be part of a situation or not be part of a situation, depending on how you predict you're going to feel about it. So we're all here to... Oh, wrong slide. We're all here today in an auditorium, hopefully because you thought, sleep, that sounds interesting. I'll go. Hopefully I'll have a good time. Hopefully you're having a good time. If you're not, there's a drinks reception later that you can use to make up for it. But presumably, there's another subgroup of people who thought, oh, I've had a whole day at work. Last thing I want is someone talking to me. I'm just going to go hang out on the beach. That's what I'm going to do to relax. And in a nutshell, what they've done is they've used how they predicted they would feel about a situation to um, decide whether or not to engage with that situation or not. And one of the reasons that I'm interested in this is because it's far easier to manage an emotion before it's already formed than it is to try and deal with it after the fact. 
So if you've already had a really strong emotional reaction to something, trying to downregulate that and make it feel better is harder than just avoiding the situation that creates the emotion in the first place. But that said, people don't really look at this very much, either in terms of mental health or in terms of sleep. So what I'm going to do for the next few slides is talk you through a couple of studies that I've done that started to piece together this relationship between sleep, situation selection, and mental health. But just before we get there, I'd just like to spend a minute talking about, well, how do we measure this thing called situation selection? And there's a few different things we can do. So there's some validated questionnaires out there that ask things like, did you, how, how likely are you to in, speak to someone who you like because you think it'll make them feel better? How likely are you to do something that you'd like to try and make yourself feel good? How likely are you to avoid doing something because it makes you feel bad? And there's a selection of these questions that together can give us two different facets. They can give us how much do we approach positive situations and things that will make us feel good, and how much do we avoid negative situations and things that will make us feel bad? Now, we can also take some of these questions that we ask on a general level, like in general, how much do you do this? And we can ask them at the end of each day. So we can say, did you do anything today because you thought it would make you feel good? And if so, what was it? Or avoid bad. You get the idea. And then lastly, you can also do various things in the lab. So one of the tasks that we've used a few times now is a video selection task. So we have a folder of videos, and it has a little thumbnail, and it has a caption. And that caption will give a bit of context and will give an emotion. So this one's from up, you're saying goodbye, it's a sad clip. We also have seal catches a ride, this one's a happy clip. Or a picnic intruder, that's quite frankly looks terrifying. Um, and so what we asked people to do in this lab-based task was we gave them this folder and we said, we're going to leave you in this room now to have a bit of a break. Here are a selection of different videos. You can watch whichever video you like or none. You can watch them in whatever order you like. You don't have to watch them all the way through. So if you start one and don't like it, you can stop it again. And then we left them for 10 minutes. So they didn't feel like they were being watched, but actually we had a screen capture running. So what we could do afterwards was we could go back and we could code how many videos were positive and how many videos were negative and which of those did they choose to engage with. And so having got these different measures, we put them into a couple of different studies. And so the first question we wanted to address was, well, does sleep have an impact on our situation selection? And this was a study that I ran whilst I was doing my postdoctoral research in Houston. And we were looking at teenagers, and we were wanting to recruit healthy teenagers for this. So we had an initial phone screening where we asked about their mental health, we asked about their sleep, and we just described the study in a bit more detail. Then what we did was we had an initial assessment where they came in, they did those trait measures that, in general, how much do you come into this event or do this because it makes you feel good, avoid that because it makes you feel bad. Um, and we asked them some other emotion measures and some in general sleep measures as well. Then we sent them away for a week. And in that week, we asked them to wear an Acti watch. And an Acti watch is a bit like a Fitbit or a Garmin. It tracks your movement, but it's especially validated so that we can use it to track sleep wake cycles. And then a few times a day, we pinged their phone and we asked them to uh, describe how they were currently feeling. And then at the end of the day, we had a sleep diary where we also incorporated these daily questions of, have you done anything today because you thought it would make you feel good? Did you avoid anything today because you were worried it would feel bad? And then at the end of that week, we came back in and we had them do this video lab task as well as some other stuff as well. And what we were really interested in was just on a correlational level, which measures of sleep were related, if any, with which measures of situation selection. And to our surprise and our horror, not much to start with. So we had a look at does how long you sleep influence situation selection? Didn't in this study. What about how long it took people to go to sleep? Nope. What time, how long they woke up for in the night? 
not related. What time they woke up in the morning, not related. But one of the things we did find was consistently related was bedtime. And so what you'll see on this graph, on the vertical axis, is how likely people were to approach positive situations. So to say, yes, I would do something because it makes me feel good. Um, and what we found was when people had low variability in bedtime, so when their bedtime was very consistent, they went to bed about the same time every night, they endorsed this quite a lot. They endorsed it a lot in general. They, at the end of every day, quite often had something that they'd done because it made them feel good. And they selected more videos in the video task, um, positive videos, that is. But then, interestingly, we found a gender split. And for girls, bedtime didn't seem to make much difference. But for boys, if boys had a really inconsistent bedtime, so perhaps they were going to bed at 10 one time, 2 the next, 11 the next night, 1 o'clock the next night, so it's very variable, we found that those boys were much less likely to engage in going to positive situations. So they're much less likely to report um, wanting to do something because it made them feel good. They watch less positive videos, and in general, they reported the same thing. And we thought that was quite interesting because it gave us our first clue that perhaps something to do with sleep was interesting in terms of situation selection. And then we also did a bit more reflection when we were thinking about kind of sleep duration. And we thought, really? If people are more tired, really, it's not affecting what they want to do? And we went back and we looked at our data. And these were teenagers in America. School starts at about 7.30 over there. It was term time, and we realised nearly all of our teenagers were chronically sleep deprived. So we would like teenagers to sleep for, say, nine to ten hours a night, and these teenagers were getting six to seven. So then that raised the question for us, well, perhaps what's happening here is that because none of our teenagers are getting enough sleep, we're just not seeing these effects compared to if people were well rested. But that said, it's not like we found no effect, so we did find this change in bedtimes for boys. But the big missing piece for this study was what it meant for mental health. So this was just looking at this first side of the triangle, does sleep affect situation selection, which is our emotion regulation strategy. And so in the second study, for the last couple of slides, what I'd like to do is talk about putting all three of these things together, sleep, emotion regulation, and mental health. And this was a study some of my really talented undergraduate dissertation students ran this year. Um, and what they did was they recruited other undergraduates to come, have an initial meeting where they filled out these questionnaires again. They did the situation section questionnaire again. And this time, they were put into one of two groups. In one group, we asked them to go to bed at their normal time, but wake up four hours later. So by doing that, as Alpar says, they're getting the early part of the sleep, they're getting their slow wave sleep, but they're missing their REM sleep. For the other group, we just asked them to get an eight hour sleep as normal. Then the next morning at their normal wake up time, so about between eight and nine, we asked them to log on and to fill in some more questionnaires. So this time we did include measures of mental health. So we had a measure of anxiety, we had a measure of mood, and we also had these situation selection measures again. So we modified the video task just to ask them which of these videos would you like to watch, and they just ticked all the ones that applied. And we also asked them how likely would you be to engage in these different situation selection behaviours, so uh, right now. And what we found was that, as we would expect, when people were sleep deprived, they felt less positive, and they felt more anxious compared to the people who were well rested. Now that's not particularly new. We see that a lot in the literature, but it was reassuring to know that that was true in our sample as well. But what was more novel and exciting for us was we saw a similar pattern with, in terms of like whether people were willing to engage in positive situations. So we found that the people who were in the sleep deprived group were less likely to report being motivated to engage in positive situations. And they also reported having less desire to watch these positive videos. So then the final step was to see, well, does this change in situation selection explain these changes in mental health? 
So we did what we call a mediation analysis, which just looks statistically to answer exactly that question. And what we found was, yes, yes, it does. So somebody who was in the sleep restricted group would be less likely to engage in positive situations. And as a result of that, would be more likely to report increased anxiety or decreased low mood. Now, this does come with a fairly big caveat. And that is, I can't say with any certainty at the moment what the direction of those effects are. So some of you might be thinking, well, hang on a sec. If you're really sleep deprived and you're just feeling a bit tired and grumpy and more anxious, perhaps it's that that makes you less likely to want to engage with something, even if it's positive. And yeah, that might be true. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow some of these people up in three months' time. And we're going to ask them about their mental health then as well. And what we can do is we can track what people were saying they did in terms of situation selection, engaging in positive situations, avoiding negative situations three months ago, with their mental health statement over time. And I think I just want to leave you with why I think this is so important. And that's because I think it really opens up avenues for treatment. Now, I'm not a clinician, so this will be something I'll be doing in conjunction with people in the clinical department. But if we can actually say for certain, actually, one of the things that's happening when people are sleep deprived is that they're less likely to want to engage with things that make them feel better, then we've got that as a target for treatment. And we can find and think about ways to try and encourage people to do these things, knowing that it's likely to have a knock-on effect on their mood. And I think having something that could potentially have a knock-on effect on people's sleep and people's mental health is a really exciting place to be. And so with that, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, none of this work is mine alone. Certainly, the second study was, like I say, some really talented undergraduates at UEA did this study. Um, and the first study was done with some external collaborators in America and a really talented team of undergraduates there as well. And finally, thank you for having me um, and, yes, for your attention. Well, thank you both for a wonderful and engaging evening. Um, I'm sure we've all got plenty of questions to, to ask. Um, those people who are online, uh, please add your questions to the chat and we'll try to come around to you guys as well. Um, if you are going to ask a question, can we ask that you wait for Mike to come around? Um, primarily for the people that are online so they can hear the questions as well. So, any questions? Sorry, in the middle. Um, thank you very much for, for both your um, talks. Um, I'm not, at first I thought perhaps my question would be um, directed to, towards you, Dr. Lazar, but I think it's probably for both of you. Um, sleep is something that I find interesting and for lots of reasons, obviously, but, but I was wondering if any of the studies you did uh, looked at what type of work people do in their, in their everyday lives. You know, if, did you look at people who, who work in night shifts? I mean, I, I'm a musician for a start, so sometimes if I'm working in the night economy, it might be that I finish at midnight, but I can't sleep because my adrenaline takes quite a few hours. I know a friend who can just go straight to bed after a concert, but I can't, but I wake up automatically at seven. And there's also the kind of the factors of adrenaline that you need to get ready for things like that. So were there any considerations in the type of jobs or any information about that or people's kind of routines in their work life that would influence their, their sleep or daily patterns? Maybe I just start with, I mean, uh, there's, there's quite a bit of literature on, the, on shift work, and the, whether that's an extended day shift or night shift, uh, with, with some um, consensus in terms of the effect, uh, knock-on effect on sleep, which we know that obviously it has an impact. And unfortunately, there are some adverse health outcomes also related to that, as mediated by the sleep impairment. Uh, in terms of the jobs that, so I'm not really aware whether, for, for example, there are, whether there are studies which actually look into the type of job related. Most of the shift work studies are related with the healthcare settings, so lots of med doctors, nurses, uh, you know, um, in the, also, also in transportation, because of course it's quite relevant. People feel during the early morning hours 
tired, exhausted. That's where most of the accidents occur, clinical errors, because whatever we do, our biological clock is going to tell us to sleep, and we try to go against that. Yeah, I mean, I don't have that much to add to that. I think the military is another big source of um, research in that area. And so I think we do have research on specific populations, but I don't know that people have necessarily looked across populations um, in, in that sense. But I think it would be something that would be really interesting to do. Good, thank you. Um, further questions from the room? At the front here, please. The, the Mediterranean siesta has always been regarded as a very healthy idea. Um, has, I'm really uh, addressing the first speaker, I, I guess. Has that been taken into consideration in... Uh, I, I, I note that you, you, you brought that in, but um, uh, we're animals, basically, and animals sleep a lot during the day. And I'm just wondering, uh, is it because we're in the north that your study is uh, concerned with a different form of sleep, which should only be at night? Well, thank you. It's a very interesting question. Well, the experimental studies, which really try to understand our biological clock and the propensity or, or, the, or the easiness to fall asleep and, and stay asleep, they show that there's a clear 24-hour pattern to that. So it means that during the circadian night, that's the largest time window optimal for sleep. That said, obviously we do take naps and, and, and the circadian rhythm is not like, a, it's, it's not necessarily a linear function. Uh, it's a monotonic function in terms of uh, our decreasing uh, uh, sleepiness during the day, but there are, there are some inflection points. And there are certainly certain points of the day when we are more inclined to fall asleep, like afternoon, early afternoon, many people after, for example, lunch, and there, there's obviously some interaction with the, with, with the digestion and other, other factors as well, and the heat uh, in, in, in certain regions. That said, I mean, um, and I think I also showed examples that certain culture, in certain cultures, people just sleep wherever they can during the day to boost their performance. However, at the moment, the guidelines, for example, the cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia, where people struggle with their sleep maintenance during the night, is clearly stating that refraining from naps during the day will help. But it's also true that it's also true that if somebody feels exhausted, then must sleep because that's going to have a detrimental effect on the waking performance. So, for example, a driver feels tired. It, it, the priority is, th is taken by the job that has to be done and then they obviously needs to sleep on it. Coming back to the Mediterranean, obviously we know that Mediterranean, uh, in the Mediterranean people are less likely to develop dementia, which is an interesting uh, question uh, because it's primarily linked to um, the diet. We think it's linked to the diet, but I think this is an interesting point. I don't think it's sufficiently investigated whether the, their sleep-wake pattern could be contributing to their decreased length. I don't know. Joe, anything to add? Um, I think the only thing I would add is that when we think about sleep, it's multifaceted. So we think about it on a biological level, as Alpa talks about it, but there are, as we've said, all these different cultural um, aspects that go uh, with it as well. So we have the siesta culture, um, sort of pre-industrial revolution, there's evidence that actually we didn't have one sleep period, but people would sleep for a few hours, wake for a few hours, and then sleep, have a second sleep like later in the night. And I think um, certainly in some cultures, although almost every culture will have a language that says good night or sleep well, um, actually in some cultures you don't have um, a sort of sense of insomnia or poor sleep because sleep is just rated so importantly that if you have a bad night's sleep, you sleep more in the day and you prioritize prioritize it. And I think we don't know that much yet about how those two different things, how the culture and the biology intersect. Thank you. So I think we'll take a question online now. I've had a nod. Uh, over here. Microphone, please. Thank you. 
So from online, we have a question for Joe, uh, and it was, uh, your thoughts on how neurodivergence can affect situational selection? I think that's a really, really good point. Um, I think... What do I think? I think all of us, to some extent, will make decisions based on potential emotional outcomes. I think where it might be different for people with neurodivergence is how they think about different situations. So, um, for example, somebody... And it's not just neurodivergence. It could be... Um, someone who is an introvert, perhaps, when they are feeling really stressed, would want to kind of go inwards, work something out by themselves, and once they've figured out a solution, then come and talk to someone else about it. Whereas someone who's an extrovert, might, their first port of call might be to phone a friend and work it out externally. Um, and so I don't want to make too many generalizations, but say um, a lot of people sort of with neurodivergence find social situations stressful. So whereas I might find them really replenishing and really engage with them, they might choose to avoid them as something stressful. So I think it's perhaps more in the perception of what's positive and what's not than perhaps the behavior of approach or avoidance. But I think it does link to another really interesting question about we kind of know that if you don't approach positive things, you feel less good. But when you avoid negative things, it's a much more nuanced picture because there are times like going to sit an exam or facing your boss when you don't like them very much where the short term might be negative, but there's a long term positive payoff for it. So I think that's a much more complex and much more nuanced relationship. And that might also play into kind of neurodivergence as well and sort of mental health more generally. So I think there's a lot more to think about when we think about like approaching positive good, avoiding negative, not necessarily good, it could be. Thank you. We'll go back online again for another online question. Uh, this is just a general one, but does medication that increases sleep length affect the sleep phases? And if it does, how? Sorry, does sleeping medication affect the sleep phases? Uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, well oh, yes, of course. So, so it depends various sleep medications. So I suppose we are talking about sedatives. Uh, they, are, they have an effect on... Um, on, on sleep, uh, I mean, most of, it depends. So one of the one of the largest group of uh, of, of pharmaceuticals, psychopharmaceuticals, related to the cardiovascular system, so like an inhibitory system within the um, within the organism, which is going to increase uh, certain elements of non-REM sleep. So it's going to, for example, it, it actually changes also the oscillatory patterns of brain activity. It's going to increase, for example, certain oscillation which contribute uh, a lot to our no light non-REM sleep is con uh, called sleep spindles. The Z drugs, the Zolpidem, Zopic Zopiclone, Zaleplone, most of these compounds, they increase uh, that part of the, of the light sleep. In terms of um, slow wave sleep, there is there there aren't that many compounds at the moment which would increase slow wave activity, such as um, sodium oxybate, which is not obviously it's not it not commonly used for insomnia, but it's used for narcolepsy, and uh, and it increases uh, slow wave sleep, so the very deep uh, deep sleep uh, of humans. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So I'll go back to the room for a last question, perhaps. We're here at the, the back. Having brought up a male child to adulthood, I can confirm with my limited sample that um, the, the evidence we presented with is quite correct. They do need 10 hours sleep when they're adolescents. Uh, it seems to me, from, on the basis of my empirical evidence, that there's no question about it. But it, the question that arises is why is the social pressure there to start school in the States at 7.30, in this country at 9 o'clock, when the people who make the decisions have themselves been teenagers and know that it's impossible to get kids up at that time? <laughs> How are we going to change this situation? Yeah, 
I think that's a really interesting question and a really important point. And there have been lots of studies. There's a big movement in America to start school start times later for high schoolers. And in lots of different districts, what they've done is they've swapped the elementary school start times, which are much later, to the high school start times, which are much earlier. Um, and um, they've seen really positive effects. So one of the arguments against it is, well, if teenagers are just going to go to bed later and later and later, if we start school later, are they just going to go to bed later still? And actually, they don't find that. They do find that if you start school later, that teenagers get more sleep, they have less absenteeism, they have less illness, they are more engaged when they're at school, there are less behavioural problems, there are less mental health problems. And certainly, there's been similar trials that have been done in Singapore. Interestingly, in the UK, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. Um, so I think in some areas it's been successful, in other areas not so much. Um, I think to answer your question about, well, why don't we just do it, I think it's because those children have parents who have to get to work and if suddenly we don't start school till 10 o'clock, what do those parents do with those children? Um, and if they then end up in after and before school club or breakfast club or what have you, we've just created the same issue. And I think also the teachers who teach that ch those children, like our body clocks as we get older, do shift. And so actually when you're in your 30s or you're in your 40s, you do start to wake up a little bit earlier. And so what we find is a teacher might think, oh, I've got this really complicated like, construct that I need to explain. I'll do it first thing when I'm most alert. But actually what's happening is the children are there, they're kind of matchstick-tied, still coming to, and they're like, what? And they would be much better at having these like, difficult things later in the day after lunch. So I think it's a tension between the whole of the rest of society that is set up to sort of start work at eight or start work at nine or whatever it might be, and how children fit in with that, and then the well-being of our children, like you say, that would benefit from a slightly later start time. Good. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I'm going to draw things to close. Um, I'd like to thank the audience here with us in the room today in London. Uh, thank you for coming to join us. And thank you to uh, the participants online on the YouTube channel. So we can have a round of applause for you guys. <laughs>I um, would also really like to thank the events team who are here, they put the show on the road, um, the sound people, the camera people who kept the show on the road, um, so thank you for your efforts. <laughs> so having heard these lectures today, I'm kind of left wondering, am I, do I sleep better because I'm happier, or am I happier because I slept better? And I'll take that to my pillow this evening, hopefully you'll have similar or different questions and thoughts to take to your pillows and you'll have a restful night's sleep. But you can join me in thanking the speakers and join us, if you'd like, in the library for drinks reception afterwards. Uh, you'd be very welcome. So thank you.